the desert fight scene is a staple of most cinema industries in India. Um, you can, it's of course the good guy smashing the living daylights out of the bad guys in the desert. But uh, I'd advise you to focus on the desert, which I will then explain to you what is so special about this desert. So Darren, I'm going to do the share screen. Yes, yeah, so we've made you co-host, perfect. There it is. Just a second, here we are. Get back to the first page where we have these clippings. Um, most, India has a large desert zone up in Rajasthan, the Thar Desert area, all these do exist there. But this desert is special. Here we go. Well, the thing about that desert. Oh dear. Sorry about that. Oh, that was the video. <laughs> it went on to further stuff which we don't need. Um, I thought I had quit the sharing, but apparently not. Just give me a moment to get out of that mess. And That's okay. That's yeah. all right. That's a beautiful desert. Yeah, well, the thing about the desert is that it wasn't a desert. And uh, have I got out of the sharing mode? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The thing about the desert is that it's in deep southern peninsular tropical India. And 50 years ago, it was an ocean of millets, millet cultivation, and people grew nine different kinds of millets over there. They then, you know, there's a there's a there's an expression in the ancient Roman historian Tacitus who wrote of the laying waste of Scotland by the Roman army. And he concluded by saying they made a desert and they called it peace. We made a desert and we called it development. What we did was to shift from the millets, which by the way, are the most nutritious stuff that you can come by, native to the soil, grown there thousands of years, and replaced it with an external species of groundnut. It's not that there was no groundnut in this area called Anantapur in Rayalaseema, the Rayalaseema region. But we brought in these hybrids and stuff from outside. And the groundnut did to this area very much what it did in the Sahel. It simply removed every trace of forest cover of everything. And this is today a desert. It's a couple of thousand acres, but spreading. Yeah. Now, the the, the thing about the fight scene is that in the southern film industry, when they did their fight scenes, they had to travel 1,200 kilometers to northwest Rajasthan in India, in India's northwest, 
put up at luxury hotels for their stars and you know spend a week there now it takes them a few hours to drive down because it's very close to the big cities of chennai and bangalore they can do their shooting in the daytime and go back home at night sleep in their own beds right um and the entire region is a wasteland of groundnut yeah and the devastation it's had on water on climate on the kinds of irrigation systems we had to bring in which we really didn't have to for the millets which were native and did very well on rainfall you know rain fed irrigation and they didn't need that much water as groundnut does so that is what i wanted to share with you people as an example of the what for us for us that story was a way of telling the story of what is happening under climate change and the role of human agency in precipitating the crisis now um i am decidedly not about to lecture you guys on climate change and climate science and you will find that as boring and repetitive as i do what i'm going to try telling you is that in the people's archive of rural india the team including myself that story which on the desert that's one of that was the first story of our climate series starting 2019 <clears throat> and i i shot that story and did did the story we'll we'll look at it so so in i'm not i'm not going to lecture you on climate change i'm just going to talk to you about what we as reporters have learned have still to learn and have unlearned about what the heck is happening with the climate crisis the, the very first thing i suppose i should say is that we approach this we have learned to approach it as a very fundamental human rights and survival issue okay i think that, i mean we sort of agree with the, the un special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights he no longer holds that post but philip alston when he was the special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights summed it up in one line at the end of his report human rights may not survive the coming crisis of a climate upheaval in fact he spoke of something which is unfolding before our eyes it's called i mean what he called the movement towards climate apartheid where the rich pay to escape heat and hunger and the rest suffer the impacts of the climate crisis that is in fact aggravated by the process of the rich building their private defenses in fact i i understand that one of you here is from jakarta i you would know a lot better than me about how a whole city can be abandoned it when when they say they're going to shift a city shift the capital you know very well who's going to get left behind who's not going to be accommodated in the new arrangements so we see this as a very fundamental human rights and survival issue which has a very serious impact on the rights the livelihoods the survival of poor and marginalized communities the world around in india there is something like 15 agro climatic zones and within those some micro climatic zones it makes it a very very complex country and geography to cover in fact the first national commission on agriculture in 1971 divided the country into they found that they had 127 agro climatic zones but if we 
ignore the uh, microclimatic zones. We are there with about a 15 major agroclimatic zones. And point three, we have something like 20 odd agroecological zones. Now, Paris, Pari is the People's Archive of Rural India. Our acronym is Pari. Our climate change reporting project. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to share with you as a fellow reporter and journalist, the stuff we are doing, some of the things which I think are pretty unique and how we go about it. Our project comes from multiple agroecological zones and over 30 regions and sub-regions, absolutely incredible diversity in the regions. But the main, the difference in our approach is all our climate stories are based on and foreground the voices and lived experience of ordinary people. All our stories are told through the lives of farmers, laborers, fisher folk, nomadic pastoralists, uh, seaweed harvesters, honey collectors, insect trappers, and more. And in the process, we are covering fragile mountainous ecosystems, forests, seas, coastal urban areas, coastal rural areas, coral islands, deserts, arid, semi-arid zones, you name it. Now, a few things which we do and which I would strongly advise people to go about is while foregrounding ordinary voices. Science and scientists are very much there in our stories. However, India's top climate scientists concur with our approach that there are many lessons to be learned from the lived experience of ordinary people directly in the line of climate impact. I'll give you many examples of that when we go to the presentation we have. Now, what about, what do you and I do as journalists? What is, what is the thing we bring to the table here? One of the things we do, part of our job, in working with specialists and experts in the field, it often becomes, it often becomes our task as journalists to translate the experts into languages spoken by human beings. The same as we often have to do with economists, right? The jargon, the terminology. Take the IPCC reports, for example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, these reports are vital. Some of them pack libraries worth of information and getting beyond the first 50 pages is a serious challenge to anyone's sanity. So we do work with, we do work with report, quote the scientists, and we look for practical manifestations in the field of what they're talking about. But we de-jargonize and do not foreground them in our stories. It seems to be somewhat silly to get out into the most inaccessible or remote regions of fragile mountainous ecosystems at 19,000 feet above sea level, and then center the scientists and not the local nomadic pastoralists whom we are staying with over there. Now, the next problem, which I think journalists will recognize quite easily, in conventional media coverage, that is another word for corporate media, the climate change coverage has become too abstract and jargonized. The process seems far removed from our readers' lives. Surveys that have been done show us that um, people associate climate change sitting in a South Asian hotspot of climate change. The middle class readers, for instance, their immediate, under, immediate association of idea when they come to climate change is the melting of the Antarctic sheet or the gutting of the Amazon forest 
or bushfires in Australia, or in terms of boring intergovernmental meetings. Now, Bari's climate reporting tries to get audiences to recognize, and it's essentially a reporting project, tries to get audiences to recognize and locate the problem as much closer to and increasingly embedded in their own lives. Uh, the first 25 of the stories on this project, the United Nations Development Program is publishing the full collection as a photo book. Now, what is it that we do that we would invite others to do? Or I'm, I'm not saying that others aren't doing it. I'm just saying for us, this is the center, central focal point of an article of faith, if you will. We tell our stories through the lives of people, especially marginalized communities, those worst affected by the climate crisis. We try telling them as far as possible through the voices and lived experience of those people. We have second point for all reporters to know. We have found that it is rather foolish to assume that we are going out into the field armed with a knowledge very superior to that of those we are covering. Now the communities you run into work with and the communities I run into and work with, they may not ever use the words climate change, but many of them have often experienced it more vividly and more profoundly than any of us ever has. For instance, in some places and communities like coastal fisherfolk, they will speak to you in terms of extreme weather events and how those have multiplied in a relatively short period of time. I mean, we get a lot on this from people in the Sundarbans, the world's largest mangrove forest, four fifths of it in Bangladesh, one fifth of it in India. And the state in which it is located, the state of West Bengal, it's seen more than 70 cyclonic storms, major cyclonic storms in a century. In one count, 105 in 125 years, but a gigantic number of them are concentrated in the last four decades. Now, people in the Sundarbans have a lot to tell us about what they experience as extreme weather information, information that we'd be very foolish to discount, but our job, information we as journalists need to convert into stories that bring alive the issue to your readers. In some places and regions, people speak to us of huge changes in agricultural yields with a depth and understanding that would shame many of the agro-scientists. And many of our scientist friends are surprised by how many illiterate people are able to make linkages between those developments, the change in agricultural yields and changes in cropping patterns and technologies. So yes, please know that the people you hope to cover have a wealth of information and knowledge to offer that is not to be scoffed at. Uh, now I'm going to the, I'm going to share screen and go over a few of the stories that tell you about them and maybe take you into the story also for a picture. Yeah, so here we go. Um, this is the, the first one is the story of the desert. Yeah, so the dramatic expressiveness of ordinary people, like when we went to this desertified area, which you saw in the film, we asked them, what, how are, what are things like? They said, oh yeah, okay. It's just that it's raining sand. And uh, the raining sand meant that every household, every house in this village has a mesh, 
a mesh gate in front of the door to stop the dust. And each and every single door with that mesh was full of mud and dirt because you actually had gigantic sandstorms. Now, uh, by the way, the seed companies have got into the act. Now, what actually happened here? In the district called Anantapur, where the millets, it was the millets basket of, this, of southern India, not only did, when you bring the boreware, when you bring the groundnut, a cash crop, as against the millets, which are food crops, native, hardy, climate resilient, require less water. You then start having to create so much irrigation that you sink tens of thousands of bore wells. Now the bore wells here, uh, a technical committee in 2018 declared that the load bearing capacity of this district was a danger, was a 70,000 bore wells. If you exceed that, they said that you're in big trouble. The year I covered it in 2019, there were an estimated 300,000 bore wells in that district with a bore well bearing capacity of 70,000 max. Now that destroyed water for all the other plantations, for all the other cultivation in that district. And that's how you have the desert coming about. Okay. Now, what happens is that the water still comes in one particular area because it's the bed of a now dead river. Yeah. So you can still sink, they're still sinking bore wells at the rate of three per acre. And seed companies have got in and got people to grow these hybrids for them from which they can get seeds. Basically, they're seed nurseries for large, large seed corporations. Um, this is, if you look at this particular thing, the day before we came there, there was crop on that soil and completely covered over in one evening's sandstorm. And she is one of those people who comes here, collects water, cultivates here, a very poor woman from that village. Uh, so this is what happened to what was once, a, the government decided and sent a high level team of experts in an armed with an SUV, four wheel drive to get in to study the desert. The humiliation of it all, when their luxury SUV got stuck in the desert sands and had to be rescued by bullock carts, the villagers went in with bullock carts and pulled out your four wheel drive SUV from there and sent the officers back to their air conditioned offices. Okay. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, each and every one of these people lived in a period, lived in a period when they were growing millets, when they still had a lot of millets. They understand the connections. They just feel trapped that they don't have options. How are we now going to go back to millets? Back? How are we going to reverse, culti reverse our cultivation process? Frankly, they don't have an answer and neither do we. But at least it's a warning of what you need to not do in the rest of that region, right? So uh, we, let's, oh, oh, okay. This is a story on an ox misnamed as a buffalo. 
it's called it is the largest bovine creature in the world the male gaur buffalo so to speak stands at 6 feet 4 inches on average yeah the shoulder and it's a rare animal endangered animal it's in two three parts of india and in the area where they are now the climate which is their natural habitat for them has seen phenomenal droughts and gigantic floods and they come out um, sorry and they are increasingly coming out into the open and destroying crop because they have to eat something and their forest has been destroyed by mining activity drilling activity you name it their forest is gone this is the largest bovine creature on earth and an endangered species yeah now the process we follow is that the reporter does as much homework as she or he can before they visit the place and by the way be prepared on on spending time in that place to do a different story from the one you went for sometimes people will point out something far more interesting in fact our buffalo story came about that way we'd gone for something on the forest and found the buffalo and we ran into farmers who were complaining they said i mean what you know and by the way the farmers are very understanding they blame the forest department and not the buffalo they understand that and they also say please understand what it is to see 50 to 100 of these creatures standing on your plot yeah 50 creatures 6 feet and above weighing tons i mean it's quite frightening it's quite chilling and that allowed us to tell a story through the experience of those farmers and tell as far as possible the story of the buffalo itself now these are an incredibly endangered community they call the chankpas you know your kashmir shawls your kashmir sweaters this is who gives you your kashmir sweaters it's those animals they and their goats that grow the kashmir wool their goats now they are saying that with the warming of the mountains with the warming of the mountains the kashmir uh, the, the goats the and animal the livestock that grows kashmir wool they are yielding much thinner milk and they are growing much thinner fur much thinner hair and therefore that's going to reflect it they say it's already reflecting in the quality of the wool they harvest from these animals yeah believe it or not and i know it's very hard to believe these guys are looking after livestock at they're grazing livestock at 19000 feet above sea level and that is a fantastic story of climate change and climate crisis now why are they, it seems insane doesn't it why would anyone be grazing livestock at 19000 By the way they were always grazing livestock at between 9000 and 14000 feet. Yeah because the yak your yak is a very very um astonishing creature. Believe me minus 30 degrees and the yak yak hangs around is actually having a fun day out. The yak will survive very well. at minus 30 of course it will be a bit painful if it continues but minus 30 they, they they don't seem to fear it the same creature if the temperature crosses plus 15 degrees it's in serious trouble and plus 20 degrees in the eastern northeastern state of sikkim has seen 250 to 300 yak 
die within a week. The heat is too much for them. 15 degrees plus is just impossible. Now when these animals, historically, their grazing pattern was, as the summer came, they went from 9,000 feet above sea level up to about 13, 12, 13,000, 14,000 feet for grazing. We're talking about the Western Himalayas. Okay, It's cold. Now they get a little more greenery and stuff and they go and graze between that 9,000 and 13, 14,000 feet. Now the mountains have stopped, started warming. The mountains have started warming. I, all, I mean, I don't know how your take on this is, but I think climate change is a cop-out term. Yeah, a compromise, which all of us have gone and accepted. Basically, a compromise foisted, us, foisted on us by the fossil fuel and energy industries, when really we should be talking about global warming. That's what we should be talking about. Now, as this warming continues, the mountains are also getting warmer. The yak cannot survive at 9,000 feet. They cannot. So as the summer comes, they're taking the yak higher and higher until this group of people have touched 90,000 feet. Now, please understand this transhumanist migration is a bloody complex and very risky and dangerous thing. How many livestock die on the route of the migrations? How many people might, you know, are risking their lives, getting up into crevasses and, you know, running the gauntlet of all kinds of risks in the ascent to the mountain. But the livestock are going higher and higher and higher for grazing because of climate. Again, by our photographer lived with them, stayed with them, made the migration, at least part of the migrant journey with them and was able to tell a beautiful story of horrible word to use to say beautiful, but to tell a powerful story of climate crisis through their everyday lives. That's why we say it's like a mantra for us. Tell your stories through the lives of people, through their voices and lived experience. Now, in the other extreme of the, this is from the well, northern extreme, the western Himalayas, the southern extreme of India in Kerala, which grows the best robusta coffee, not Arabica, but the best varieties of robusta coffee, come from here. And they are reeling, reeling in the mountains of the Western Ghats from a rise in temperatures, erratic rainfall. You know, I have worked a lot in this district and it was called the air conditioned district because it's had such pleasant, lovely climate, perfect for coffee growing. Absolutely perfect for coffee growing. Now the coffee industry is in, a, is in the doldrums. People are in the doldrums, people who were much better off. These were not marginalized poor farmers. These were farmers who were doing much better than many of their contemporaries. It's all in the pot. And they also recognize that it's changing for the worse and are, people are working on it. Scientific institutions have set up base there to see what they can do, but it is affecting the coffee, the quality of the coffee, and the quantity of the harvest as well. Oh, I love this particular story. Again, it tells you, please notice that in every case, whether with the yak or whatever, I'm going to show you how people are trying to cope. Their survival strategies, they cope. Would you believe that this bunch, that little boy, I mean, he's not a little boy, is 14, 15. Um, these are from the fishing community on the Pamban Island of the southern tip of 
India, one of the southern tips, Tamil Nadu's Ramanathapuram district. You know what they're advertising? This group of people, fisher folk, on their own initiative, have set up a radio station to understand, engage with, grapple with issues of global warming, the warming of the seas. Remember, they are fishermen and they are very severely affected by a large number of things that's happening to them. The warming of the seas, the roughness of the seas. So they've actually created, a, and he is advertising, the banner he's holding is for their radio station, Kadalosai, which means the voice of the waves, the sound of the sound of the sea or voice of the waves, whichever you please. Now, in interviewing people for this story, our reporter had some incredible experiences. These are a very, very knowledgeable, if illiterate, community, educated by experience. So we are talking to a very old fisherwoman who's been, she's in her 60s. And she was giving us the history of how many different channels there were in the sea and how many different species of fish would be in which channel. So she rattled off some 30, 40 species of fish. Then she rattled off another 10 or 12. And she said, okay, these fish would you normally school in this channel of the sea. Those species would normally school in that channel of the sea. And then she told us, and today if we have to find those species, we're going to have to look for them on Discovery Channel. <laughs> she said, that's the only place you're going to find those. That's the only channel you're going to find those fish on. Right. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm not taking you through every story, but you can see the, uh, the, the wonderful thing about this radio station is that the RJs are all practicing fishermen. They are practicing fishermen. So sometimes they even do recordings on their boats. Yeah, I, I mm -hmm. think this is simply splendid. How much more, how much more advanced the communities are on this problem than we as journalists are. Mm -hmm. And I really think a little humility is in order over here, right? So uh, um, that is, oops, just a second please. Yeah, so this is a place called, uh, I mean, this is a permanent rain shadow, a terribly drought stricken place where every year now, people and government have to create gigantic cattle camps because the cattle are starving and, and also dying of thirst. So you have to create these giant camps to look after them. And, uh, you know, in the last 20 years, you can mark the changes in the cropping patterns, in the harvest, in what kind of products are being used and what kind of technologies. Now here is another result of the kind of fooling around with technologies and exotic crops and stuff. This is in the state where I am based. I'm now talking to you from Mumbai state, which is the capital city of the state of Maharashtra, 120, 120 million people strong state. Now, this area, which is a very, very hot area, year after year, is seeing hailstorms at 43 degrees Celsius. And the bloody hail is as big as golf balls. It has killed livestock. Every year we are covering the death of livestock from, I mean, the main press is covering in small paragraphs how many sheep died, how many goats died, how many cattle died as a result of 
what the heck are we doing with hailstorms at 43 degrees Celsius? Yeah, I think again, that gave us a lead in to reporting things through the lives of people, what they were growing, what they think is happening, and what they think is happening is extremely important to your story. And usually, they come out with phenomenal insights. Now, back to our Himalayans, but this is the Eastern Himalayas, and these are people who, in trying to adapt, have done some astonishing things. Uh, incidentally, this little animal following the farmer uphill, it's not his dog. It's not his faithful dog. It's a baby yak, and it thinks the farmer is his mother, so it's following him. It's a very, very small baby yak. Now, as I said, the yak is a terrific creature, but as it gets warmer, the yak is in big trouble. What have the Brokpas, this community is called Brokpas. The Western Himalayan guys are called Ch Changpas. The Brokpas have used an existing system, an existing species to try and offset the disaster. Okay, what they've done is there is a high, they are hybriding animals crossing the yak with highland cattle called coat. By crossing yak and coat, highland cattle, you get a creature called Zomo. And you can see the Zomo. Um, the Zomo has many of the traits of highland cattle, which means it's much more resilient to higher temperatures, much higher temperatures. At the same time, there are problems in the sense that the male Zomo cannot reproduce, etc., etc. all those issues come up. But here are a group of an ancient nomadic pastoral community, community who tell us, look, the Zomos have been around. But in recent decades, <coughs> we have started breeding them in much larger numbers because it offers us some protection and insurance since these animals are incredibly more resilient to higher temp in under higher temperatures. Again, these are guys who go up to 17, 18,000 feet with their animals. All this is at about 17,000 feet with their horses, which are also very, very hardy conditioned mountain horses. So, uh, so there you are. A, the Brokpas, again, like their Western Himalayan counterparts, and please understand that no communities are more endangered, more threatened than fishing communities and nomadic pastorals. India is home to perhaps the largest number of nomadic pastoralist groups within one country. And okay, this is the Sundarbans, which I told you about, famous for the Sundarbans tiger, the Bengal tiger and also um, the largest mangroves in the world. Would you believe, I mean, this in one estimate, 105 cyclones in 125 years have hit this coast. Not all of them hit the Sundarbans, but have hit this coast. And every year, imagine that your house, your school is uprooted. Life is becoming impossible. And yet, you're going to see a retreat into climate apartheid as the rich try to block some zones of the Sundarbans for tourism and the pleasure of travel and look, trying to see a tiger, etc. Now, this is another group, another group of nomadic pastoralists. Every year, this community, this is in the desert regions of Kutch in Gujarat. There are nomadic pastoralists in the mountainous ecosystems. There are people in the arid zones. 
fully arid zones. Now, this community, they travel with 14, 15, sometimes with hundreds of camels, sometimes with a flock of up to 300, 500 sheep. And they gave us a great insight into how the collapse of the market for wool in the world has destroyed them because everyone is into acrylic and other substitutes. Now, these guys do an 800 kilometer migrational circuit every single year of their lives. They're going through desert zones, they're going through arid zones, they're having to feed livestock. How the heck you manage to do that? And now they're saying it's becoming impossible because all forest vegetation, such as there was, is disappearing with the major changes in climate. Um, then, here we have a predictive story because we're looking at climate change I'm sorry, you're going to hear some drilling sound in the background because there's some renovation going on in the complex. Um, they're building our own climate change uh, in the kind of construction we're doing here. This, by the way, is the home, the Yangtze Valley and China, uh, in China, and the Koraput Jaipur region in Odisha are the birthplace of paddy cultivars, meaning the birthplace of rice. Rice strains in this region go back 8,000 years. The Yangtze Valley and here were simultaneously seeing conscious human cultivation of paddy, of rice. There's wild rice, there's brown rice, there's red rice, there's black rice. Yeah, there's black rice and red rice too. All these incredible wealth and diversity, then they're finished because now we've brought BT cotton, genetically modified stuff into that area, destroying the local species at will as it corners all the water and is used with unbelievable amounts of pesticide. We are looking at climate crisis in the making, in the birthplace of rice. If you notice, there is not a single story here, which we have tried telling us detached observers. Every one of them is told through the lives of people. Now here is a person who made the switch to cotton and now seriously regrets it and says it's become a headache, but we don't know how to revert. This is part of the challenge in reporting. What are the options people have? What are the options people feel they have? And so on. I want to, I'll, I'll do this one more story because this is one of the most difficult stories ever done, I believe, on climate. Not that not that reporting at 19,000 feet was a cakewalk. But this community of fisher women on the southern tip of the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, they are seaweed harvesters. Every morning, they walk from home to office. That's about 400 yards because they walk out of their huts and walk into the sea. They dive into the sea up to six meters, up to, well, maybe four or five meters more commonly. And generally they hope to do it between two and four meters. And they collect seaweed. Now the seaweed you're seeing in the bag on her hand, that produces billions of dollars for global pharma. For, yeah, for the big guys, who made another gigantic killing during COVID, right? So these, these guys, these women, they get a 
pittance. They get a few cents per kilogram of what they cover. I mean, totally in a day, you know, two, three dollars worth. But what they collect produces wealth for billionaires. Now, what interested us about these women was how much they knew and understood of what has happened to the sea in the last 25, 30 years. It's from that same uh, circle of women who said, the fish we now have to find on Discovery Channel, right? So they dive into the sea and collect, they, what kind of equipment do they have, by the way? They have goggles. That's a new innovation. Now, our photographer, who comes from a similar community of very poor agricultural laborers, dived into the sea with them, stayed in their huts at night, walked into the sea, dived into the sea with them. These fishing women, fishing community women, spend more time in the water than they do on boats because they're actually diving and collecting it. Here, I, I just want to show you what brilliant um, photographs in the telling of the story, how much work a reporter photographer put into doing this story. All he had was one, he is from a very poor background himself, this photographer. I predict he will be a world name in a couple of years. He dives, he gets an old GoPro, you know, the first edition of GoPro, dives into the water and starts clicking. Have a look at this. This is four to six meters below the surface of the sea. She's coming up with the seaweed. I think they're one of the most beautiful shots of working at sea that I have seen in years and years and years. So they tie these bags together of seaweed and that's the retreat because they've gone pretty far out into the sea. They come back on the boat. They go on the boat, dive in. First they clear what is closest to the coast and then they keep going further. That's after six, eight hours of this kind of exhausting work. He's taken the shoal of fish from below the fish. He shot them from below. So guys, so uh, I'll stop sharing there and wind up on what I would say is necessary. There were a couple of more stories, but I think we need some time for discussion. So I'm saying this, that we created, oh, we have, we have one story. We have one story on bugs, on insects. Most journalists are not aware I'm sure of many of you are, but as a rule, most journalists and much of the public are not aware that 75% of crops in the world are dependent on pollinating insects. And those insects are dying rapidly. In the West, you have some attention because the bees are going. And by the way, there are some 20,000 species of bees, okay? All, all bees. In India, our collaboration with the National Center for Biological Sciences, as I said, we work with scientists. We don't just program them and they find our work useful. We find them invaluable. And they have told us 40% of pollinating species in Indian 
insects are in steep decline, some of them in perhaps irreversible decline. Now think of what that's going to do to a country full of hungry people. There will be food, but it's going to be more and more out of reach of the poor. So uh, here's what I would uh, say. We ask, uh, we make our reporters go to the field with two cheat sheets. One is the homework to be done before they get into the field. One is what they do in the field. But the, the stuff that I think can be done before one goes to the field is uh, the following. Classifying your region, the place you're going to do. Number one, is your region arid, semi-arid, mountainous, coastal, tropical, fragile ecosystem? Two, how is the soil classified in this region? What are the main soil types? And what are the main occupations of the soil and of the water and of the forests? You know, the, the forest dwellers, the honey producers, the honey collectors more correctly. How is the soil classified? What are the main soil types? What are the main forest types? Three, what is it? What is the crop history and patterning of that region? You must aim to acquire a good understanding of the agroecology of the region you are covering before you get down there. Four, what have been the river water tables in that region in the last 40 to 50 years? How many perennial rivers are there, semi perennial rivers in your region? Are they running dry? If so, why and since when? Five, arm yourself with all the rainfall data that you can find and be prepared on getting into the field to find that the data is obsolete, bad, whatever, but you still need it. Six, have a sense of a collation of the sources of irrigation in the region you're covering rain fed dams, rivers, ponds, lakes, etc. Seven, very importantly, in most of our countries, how much has the availability of water per person dropped in the last 50 years? In India, the drop is frightening, okay? It's just so scary, I won't tell you what it's like. Eight, if the Borwell technologies have made their appearance. Collect Borwell data. Incidentally, there is a small town in the south of India called Tiruchan Gore, the Borwell rig capital of the world. Its Borwells are operating in 16 African countries in every state and union territory of India. And I calculate that at a very conservative estimate, the borewell rigs of this one town in India alone are drilling 2 billion feet, B, 2 billion feet into the aquifer every single year, and that is escalating. Nine, what is the extent of marshlands in your area? Ten, what is the extent of forest cover? What are the main... Um, what are the main kind of trees and forest uh, vegetation that you get? Rainfall, uh, incidentally, there is a very, very useful, one of the few really useful things the New York Times has done on climate. They created a global warming tracker. I have used this for every one of our stories. It tells you in the region you are covering, the data goes back to 1960. And it lets you know how many intense heat days have increased from 1960 to the present year. For instance, how, how do they de 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 uh, de uh, define the intense heat day? 
38 degrees Celsius and above is called intense heat days. In some of those regions I showed you in the stories, the in, those were to begin with warm regions and the intense heat days has grown by 50 to 60% in 60 years. Yeah. So you need to get the rainfall data. You need to benchmark it. You need to get, you need to use the New York Times global warming tracker. Look at how many days of heat have grown. One of the photos I showed you, with, which I didn't have time to go into, was a place called Churu, which in 2020, in May 2020, was declared the hottest place on the planet at 51 degrees Celsius on that on those two days. But what they never reported to you was that the same Churu had the coldest temperatures six months later in the northern plains of India and fell to sub-zero temperatures. Now, there are your stories, these variations, these gaps, these expansions, these collapses. Then you also need to get together your agriculture facts and figures, which are the main crops of the district. Benchmark, sequence it. What were yields a few decades ago? One decade ago and now. Get basic geographical information classified solid. Have conversations with people. Don't go and use that word climate change and prejudge everything. <clears throat> Talk to them about extreme weather episodes. How has rainfall behaved these last few years? You'll get more information than you dreamed of. If you go with them and say, I want to talk to you about climate change, there won't be a lot of talking done. And approach every story with every approach must be human and storytelling. That is our job. That is our job. Make the story more visual. Shoot those videos, shoot those photographs. You saw the kind of pictures we have. Foreground the voices of people. Use scientists, refer to them, use reports, but foreground the voices of ordinary people. People in their voices, in their idioms, they may say things spectacular. You know, like the broadcast told us, maybe we made the mountain god angry. They gave us great headlines anyway. But the point is this, and I end with that. When we say it in our voices, it sounds like a report. When it's said in their voices, it becomes more like storytelling. And I think the challenge of climate report is going to be around storytelling. Thank you.